What is rollerblading? And who are we as a sport, an industry, a culture? It's no secret that our sport has evolved and changed in some pretty drastic ways over the last few decades, redefining our collective identity. We've gone from rollerblading, to inline skating, to aggressive skating, to freestyle rolling, and back to rollerblading. You see, one way or another, our future is inexorably tied to our past, and studying our past is the best way to safeguard our future. That's why I reached out to David Hoffman, prolific documentary filmmaker responsible for creating this. It's all good. It's all good is a literal time capsule of rollerblading history, a documentary following the lives of professional rollerbladers as they prepare for the 1997 ASA Championships. I'm Butch Lehman of Roll Minnesota, and I invite you to join me and David Hoffman on this journey through our sports history. Unlike most rollerblading films, with skater profiles set to music, It's All Good is a documentary film. Released in 1998, it provides a rare look at what many people consider to be the golden era of our sport. The film follows two teams, FR, out of New York, and Senate, out of California. Along the way, we get to observe the behind-the-scenes lifestyles of some of our industry's pioneers as they attempt to navigate the exciting, yet treacherous landscape of professional rollerblading. Today I'm joined by David Hoffman to give us some insights on his film and an outsider perspective of the culture that we have come to embrace as our own. Good morning, David, and thanks for taking some time out of your busy schedule to share some of your experiences and observations with us. Just for our benefit, I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you became involved in this film. Well, I'm a documentary filmmaker. 58 years doing documentaries, thousands of clips on YouTube. So I'm very active on YouTube, as you may know, Butch. And I, I do two kinds of documentaries, mostly documentaries for hire. Somebody gives me the money. As long as it's not a subject I hate, I'm going to do it. So this Silicon Valley genius has a son who's a rollerblader. And we're friends. And he says, David, could you do a documentary about these guys? My son is a rollerblader, and I don't really understand them as a parent of a rollerblader. So think about it this way. The rollerbladers knew their world very well. We can talk about that. But the parents, the school, the larger adult society didn't really get this at all. So I tried to make a movie that expressed what these people were like as seen from the outside. I've never been a skater. I didn't get in with them, but I sure liked them a lot. That's how the film got made. This guy paid for it. And it opened at a very successful, big, independent theater in New York as a feature. Who comes? Rollerbladers. No parents, no school, no society. Nobody pays attention to it except the rollerbladers who think it's funny. They've never seen a film like this. They've seen rollerblader movies, as you know. Guys skating incredibly, filming other guys skating. Incredible stuff. I mean, hard to believe some of the videos that were made by rollerbladers and still are. But my film is a documentary about rollerbladers and looking specifically at two teams. I chose these teams because one was classic New York, FR. Classic New York. Street people. Immigrant children. Uh, tough. The other was LA. Senate. Lots of money. Um, Southern California. The feeling of California, two completely different states of mind. And I focused on them headed towards the ASA competition of 1997, which at the time was a big deal. It had already been on ESPN. I mean, the, the competitions had been on ESPN. So the ASA was classic, Florida. That's the story of my film. The stage was set just a few years earlier as action sports, led by rollerblading sudden surge in popularity, became a defining characteristic of the cultural zeitgeist of the 1990s. In 1995, the X Games hosted its inaugural event, featuring three different inline skating disciplines, vert, street, and downhill. With the overwhelming success of televised action sports, the ASA, or Aggressive Skating Association, was formed, and along with it, 
an inline skating competition circuit culminating in the ASA Championships, where amateur skaters could earn the right to turn pro. Among those competing for this honor, in It's All Good, are some iconic names such as Dustin Latimer, Kevin Gillen, and Louis Zamora. You know, David, I think that's one of the things that your film does so effectively. It, it sort of humanizes both the dreams and the struggles of the various personalities involved. It showcases the rebellious, countercultural movement of aggressive skating, while also peeling back some of the stereotypes. You know, we get a glimpse of the camaraderie, the creativity, the passion that these young skaters had for their sport and show to each other. Nobody really understood why anybody would take a skate and go down a rail sideways on a skate, which wasn't designed for that purpose, along cement. What, what kind of a crazy sport is that? Completely loony. And the things that, that these boys and some girls did were amazing athletics. That was a surprise. Second, you fall down a lot and you get hurt a lot. Nobody could understand blood, injury, no helmets. What are you people, crazy? So I entered the world of rollerblading with those innocent questions. What I found were first, these were good people. These were not gang members. They were not um, dangerous. They didn't want to fight. A lot of them were physically small. They weren't giant. There were some big guys, but most of them were little guys. And they were in a sport that was truly dangerous and required skill. And the girls who watched these skater boys really liked them. So that's important. You're a teenager. Um, you got to establish yourself somehow as a male. How do you establish yourself? Well, you're a rollerblader and you're damn good at it. And some of these activities that the boys did and a few girls were amazing. So what I tried to do was look into who these people were how they treated each other, which was beautifully, beautifully, uh, a sweetness. What kind of a sport does that? The competitors, yes, they were competitors, but they honored the people who beat them. That is a part of the sport. There was, you win, great. You lose, great. Uh, I thought that was quite extraordinary. And I think it's still that way. Although I, like many others, was shocked at how the sport just seemed to die. It, it was headed towards the Olympics. Everybody was talking about rollerblading as an Olympic competition. And then all of a sudden, nobody's doing it. Whereas the skateboarders who were hostile to the rollerbladers from the start and not particularly nice, didn't have the same point of view. Um, they kept on going. They kept on growing in popularity with this also nutty on a piece of wood with four wheels doing wacky things. And sp it just seems crazy. But they got pretty far with that where rollerblading died. In 2004, rollerblading was dropped unceremoniously from the X Games, signaling a downward trend that would last for decades. During that time, countless companies would be lost, including Senate, the financial powerhouse that once seemed invincible. In fact, in 1996, just one year prior to the filming of It's All Good, Senate made over $13 million. So what happened to rollerblading? While many people attribute rollerblading's sudden demise to an external cause such as the lack of support from the X Games or animosity from more established action sports like skateboarding or BMX, the truth is that the fractures were already forming in rollerblading's internal foundation. As someone deeply immersed in the culture, I think your film demonstrates how amazingly ill-prepared rollerbladers at the time were for the types of responsibilities like talking to the media, representing sponsors, or even running companies. Yeah, these kids were amazing at skating, but most were just teenagers and they were thrust into the spotlight and seemed to lack some of those, the soft skills that are needed to market the sport. In fact, there was a scene with Randy Spicer, I think, where he was being interviewed after winning a competition and he could hardly articulate more than one word responses. Yeah, Randy! More words than good and happy. He was there was another situation with Arlo Eisenberg where he's questioning uh, the intellectual property Why can't I use of, it? of things. What I want to know. Because it's their, it's their stuff. We've signed an agreement. We told them. 
that we wouldn't be copying things, we wouldn't be using the thing. And if you make a conscious decision to go forward and we get sued and lose the company, but then you then you did it and you did it with the knowledge that that could happen. And so, I want to ask our just seems like there was a lack of maturity and experience to represent the sport's own best interests. I think that's the best analysis of I've ever heard of what actually happened. That's absolutely right. If you look at the rollerblading rollerblade company and the other companies, they had these kids as pros. They gave them money, but they gave them absolutely no training into how to present, A, and two, what the world around them thought. Because to be a good presenter, you've got to understand the audience you're talking to. There were subtleties, in, and there are subtleties, as you know, in rollerblading that I had no idea about. Didn't even know the language. So if I was a typical audience, I don't know what they're talking about. I have a scene in the film I'm very proud of where I got very high speed 16 millimeter cameras and slowed up the ASA competition. So you could see the subtlety of movements, of jumps, of slides. And when you do, you get a sense for what the rollerbladers are looking at, what they're seeing in other rollerbladers. I think that Arlo, got, Arlo and Brooke Howard Smith and uh, Ryan Jack Lone and the other stars of that time. Never let the rail own you. I own that rail. Were colorful, really colorful characters with a wise ass sort of a push it at the society attitude, which was very appealing, but nothing beyond that. So when you look at Randy Spicer, who was a really good guy, wanted to help us in the film, but I had no idea. He does had a lot of girls around him. He was having a really good time, and they're making pretty good money. I mean, Senate is rolling it in. I don't know why Senate failed. They had good clothing, provocative ideas, great skaters on their team. FR fascinated me because FR had an attitude that I had never heard before, although I fully understand as a New Yorker. And that was, what do we do? We represent. We represent. They went to these competitions representing. What were they representing? They were representing the streets of New York, the culture of those streets, Puerto Rican, Nicaraguan, others. It was wonderful, I thought. They really had a sense of their culture. Streets of New York taught me how to live and how to act, and how to represent myself and how to skate to where some bigger kid's not gonna say, what size are your skates? You take them. Now, how do you communicate that to the main America? Well, I'm not sure you do, but there are many, many more, I believe, people who would appreciate this if they understood it, even if they didn't like the culture. For example, they took the streets of New York and they used those streets in a way that had never been used out before. Bicyclists don't do it. Walkers don't do it. They, they made the streets theirs. With so much money and corporate influence coursing through the rollerblading industry, most modern day skaters would hardly recognize this ancestral version of our sport. Scheduled training sessions, team meetings, traveling demos, and sponsorship auditions, that's right, auditions, and high stakes competition were a reality of the rollerblading business model. Paul, do a soy out down that. Yeah. What's going on? In fact, one of my favorite scenes is when the FR team brought along the police commissioner for a street session. That's pretty impressive. <laughs> of course, one thing that has remained consistent in rollerblading, though, is its own inconsistency. So one of the things that I noticed in watching the film, and I have to assume this was intentional, is that the two teams you chose to profile took very different approaches to marketing and, and management. On the one hand, Senate was really edgy and abrasive with their destroy all girls controversy and the unapologetic attitude. But on the other hand, FR had a team where the manager met with prospective skaters' families and actually told one skater that he had to quit smoking um, in order to represent the company's guy. image. I'm willing to give that up for FR. Uh, you know, it's not even that, it's not even that it's for me. And, uh... And so, from a narrative standpoint, I think that creates a really compelling contrast and shows a couple different sides of the sport. Well, thank you for that. That is exactly correct. And that is exactly why I chose those two teams. 
New York and L.A. Are, were two different countries. They still are to some extent. When you think about the Paul Simon, my era musician, won't leave New York. He's a New Yorker. There's, you know what you you know what that means when you're a New Yorker, as I am. And L.A. was an, a distant, foreign, rich guy, sort of play at the beach. Yet you're absolutely correct. Uh, Arlo and Brooke Howard Smith and other guys, they were really edgy. Get hurt. You remember that famous documentary where Brooke Howard Smith has got blood coming on it. Uh, you got to get hurt. You got to hurt yourself. Well, that wasn't the view of FR. The view of FR was it happens, but the goal is to avoid it, to respect each other, to treat the communities right, to treat the families right. When he's on Long Island and he's interviewing that prospective um, skater, the parents are very respectful. The son is very respectful. It's very different from LA. And I love that difference. Despite the divergent approaches of these two companies, the goal was the same to win the ASA championships. To do so would require skill, a competitive spirit, and a balanced approach of strategy and consistency. With 40 total competitors from across the country and only the top 10 earning the right to turn pro, these young skaters experienced a new type of pressure that is still widely absent from rollerblading today. The pressure to represent something greater than oneself, whether it be the company they ride for, the community they represent, or the entire sport of rollerblading. When you got to the big competition in Florida, the ASA, the ASA did a pretty damn good job of putting drama into this. But if you watch FR particularly, the way the attitude is we came, we represented, it doesn't matter if we win or lose. That attitude, which may still be in rollerblading, was very damaging because sports have winners and losers. They have competitions where people really care. And you didn't get the feeling. I kept looking at the, I kept asking the skaters, you know, be serious about this. This is important. Do you want to win now? We don't really care. We're here to have a good time. Well, they're not there to have a good time. If they're representing a sport and they're representing a city, it's far more serious than that. That took some coaching and some counseling that nobody gave the rollerbladers back then. If it happens again, where somebody in the press starts to notice, it's got to be serious. It's got to matter. If it doesn't matter, why should I care as a viewer? Yeah, I, I think that's a great observation. And I don't know if I have the answer to it. Um, I do think that what we're seeing now anyway, as we reflect on our past, is there has to be a balance. We want rollerblading to be expressive and creative and fun. And that's really what the culture is about and what separates rollerblading from a more traditional sport is that the skaters aren't competing with other skaters so much as they're competing against themselves. But I do think you're absolutely right. In order for the culture to grow, we need to market it strategically. And I'm happy to say that I think that there are some tremendous professionals in the sport right now that are doing a really excellent job at that. And we see inline skating seems to be trending in the right direction. Once again, let me just say, I thought what you just said was brilliant. I mean, you're very good at this, so I, it's a compliment I don't give lightly. Thank you. Um, your understanding of, that's right, maintain the culture, grow the culture, understand the culture on the one hand, and on the other hand, let mainstream enjoy it. Now, that's tricky. While opinions remain divided about corporate influences on rollerblading culture, one universal truth from the film seems more applicable now than ever before. It's all good. It's all good. Rollerblading is a sport that's all about persistence in the face of adversity. Whether it's getting up after missing a trick or weathering the storm of financial hardship, rollerbladers persevere. That's what we do. That's who we are. David, I just want to say thank you for joining us today and for sharing your insights and experiences with us. This film truly is a historical artifact and it's doing an important job preserving a piece of our past and our identity as a community. Listen, I want to thank you for noticing my film, my documentary. I hope your audience, that you present a bit of it on your show, because it's fun to watch as history, as characters, as the evolution of the sport. 
If you guys haven't seen It's All Good, I encourage each and every one of you to visit Amazon right now and pick up a copy. I believe it's available to stream digitally um, as well as a hard copy on DVD. I'll go ahead and leave a link in the description below if you guys want to check it out. The only advantage to buying it in DVD form, it's, it's a collectible. It's All Good, the DVD, that is a collectible right now. People really want to have it. Just as you'd want to have an old LP vinyl, this thing's also collectible, it's history. Thanks again to our guest, legendary filmmaker, David Hoffman, and thank you all for joining me for this episode of Roll Minnesota. I'm Butch Lehman, and until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and get out there and do some rollerblading. We'll see you guys next time. Peace.